Claudia Vickers is a research associate at the Australian Institute for Bio Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland. She's currently working on the Sucrose to Bio Products Program, which is focusing on developing E. coli strains to produce biofuels from sucrose. Please welcome Claudia Vickers. Thanks very much, Alan, and welcome everybody. It's really great to see you all out here tonight. So I'm going to start with a very quick overview of the history of the, the science that's al allowed us to get to where we are now and to develop something that's called synthetic biology. So in um, 1865, this chap called Gregor Mendel actually realised or discovered that genes were the, the units of hereditary, the things that can be passed or passed information from one generation to another. And it wasn't until almost 100 years later that these two very famous chaps, Watson and Crick, worked out the DNA structure. A little later, something called the central dogma of uh, molecular biology or of genetics was developed. And that's that this, um, this idea that the DNA carries the code and that is uh, transcribed into a message called RNA, which is then transla translated into the proteins. And the proteins are actually the workhorses of the cell. Now, it's actually quite a lot more, sim more complicated than this we now know, but of course this is the original central dogma and it, it pretty much works for explaining things in general to people. So in 1966 the genetic code was cracked and we then actually knew how to read that code. 1972 the first recombinant DNA molecule was made. That meant that we could then cut and paste little bits of DNA next to each other and change the order of things and that was really the birth of genetic modification. 1980, a guy called Carrie Mallis developed this process called polymerase chain reaction. That meant that we could write the code if we had a template. So we could copy from DNA that already existed in the cells, make lots of it, and then we could do a lot more of this genetic modification. So that was all very well and good, but it wasn't until you could do these things a lot and fast that we could actually go very far forward in the technology. So the first step was automated DNA sequencing, and that allowed us to actually read enormous amounts of DNA very, very quickly and allowed us to sequence the human genome in 2003. DNA synthesis very quickly followed, and that allowed us to write the DNA code. And these days, we can actually clone by phone or simply call up a biotechnology company or email a biotechnology company and say, this is the sequence we want, can you please make it? And they go, yes, no worries, make it up and send it to us in the lab and off we go and clone something with it. And the cost for these technologies are decreasing extremely rapidly. So the price for synthesis, for example, is decreasing by about 50% every two years. And that means that it's going faster than what's happening, what has been happening in the last several decades in the IT revolution. So that allowed us to develop something called synthetic life, or at least this chap called uh, J. Craig Venter. In 2006, he uh, developed, started the eponymously named J. Craig Venter Institute. And in 2007, he announced first, the first case of a genome transplantation. And that, in that instance, he took the genome from one organism and went to a cell from another species, stripped the genome out, and put the new, organ, new organism's genome in. And that cell could then behave in, in exactly the same way as the original uh, species where he took the genome from. The next step was the minimal genome, so shaving down that genome and removing all the genes that weren't absolutely necessary for survival of that organism. And then finally, in May 2010, there was genome recreation. So the Vent at the Venter Institute, they took that genome, they um, actually synthesized an entire genome, transferred into a cell and kick-started it, brought it to life in essence, and then that cell was able to replicate and grow. So he used the, the minimal genome to do that, but he actually put in a tag, and that tag is what you see there, the blue colour, right? And this is a, a gene which can encodes a protein that can make a blue dye. So that's all well and good. Um, what's really important, though, is that what we're now thinking of as cells as living programmable machines, okay? So I want you to think of an analogy of a computer where you have a number of bits and pieces, a memory, a CPU, you have keyboards, you have a mouse, you have all these different things, and together they give you the functionality to allow you to do all these different things on a computer. And you've got a code that you can use to program the computer and develop software and such forth. Well, cells are very, very similar. 
they're a sort of an outside chassis and there are a whole lot of little bits and pieces like DNA and RNA and proteins inside them that allow them to do all the weird and wonderful things that they do. Of course, cells are a little bit more complicated than a typical computer. So this is, this is a um, metabolic network or um, basically the, the circuitry inside the cell. Now, in a computer, you have electrons zipping around in electrical circuits, right? In a cell, you have carbon, which is the, the um, I guess, the molecule that carries the information throughout the cell. So try to keep that analogy in your mind as we're going through the rest of the talk tonight. So synthetic biology is a tool that we use to make genetically modified organisms. So it's a blending of biology and engineering. And what we're doing is redesigning um, existing things, existing biological parts, so the DNA, the RNA and the protein, or we're creating new biological parts that don't actually currently exist in nature. And if we want to know which parts we can use and, and make sure that they all cooperate together, then we go to this online toolbox which is known as BioBricks. It's kind of like a shopping mall for synthetic biologists. And you go and you sort of have a look and grab the little bits and pieces that you then want to build together to create whatever it is that you want to create. And the nice thing about that is freely available. So it's all shared between the scientific community. And so I want you to take away from this the idea that synthetic biology is not just synthetic life. It's not Craig Venter's Cynthia, just. There's a whole lot of other things that we can do with it. So what can we make with it? Well, these are quite interesting examples. So um, both of these are uh, E. coli that has been genetically engineered to produce a protein that fluoresces in pretty colours. And the protein fluoresces in response to specific environmental cues. So the bacterium is sort of sensing things in its environment. And particularly on this side here, you can see a range of colours and the protein is fluorescing in different colours depending on what the environmental signal is, in this case, different wavelengths of light. We can also make bacteria that behave like photographic film. So they sense light as well, but they behave differently depending on um, whether or not they see or they don't see light. And you can all recognise this chap on the, the right, Einstein. We can also do things that actually have a bit more of an effect on our everyday lives, or certainly the everyday lives of people in developing countries. So a really nice example that I like to use is artemisinin. This is a treatment for malaria. Malaria kills up to 3 million people of each, each year, and 90% of those are children under the age of five. Artemisinin is anti-malarial. It's produced in a herb called sweet wormwood. It takes 14 months to produce it, however, and the production is extremely variable because plants will grow differently depending on how much water, how much light, etc., that they're exposed to. So you get quite big spikes in the cost of this anti-malarial anti drug, and that's passed on the con to the consumer. The consumer, in this case, earns just about $1 a day. So they really can't afford to pay extra, and a lot of the time they can't afford to pay for it at all. So the solution was to engineer a bug, in this case a yeast, to make artemisinin. And this was developed in the lab of a guy called Jay Kiesling in um, the US. So it took 40 different synthetic biology components, built a new pathway inside the organism, engineered that pathway so that the carbon that was being used to make the artemisinin would flow freely and quickly to that product. And it turned out that he could produce that at a fraction of a cost as you can produce it in Wormwood. And that's now on the market and available. What we're doing in my lab is looking at producing jet fuel from sugar cane. And the rationale for this is fairly straightforward. The aviation industry at the moment is depending on liquid fuels with a high energy content. It's kind of hard to get a jet up in the air on an electric engine, so it's, they're always going to need liquid fuels. And there's quite strong industry support for sustainable production because in the EU at the moment they're looking at needing to get 20% renewable fuels, aviation fuel by 2020 or 2025 I think it is. And that's probably going to happen across the rest of the world um, fairly shortly. So in Australia, um, we're interested in, in sugar, and that is sucrose, which is a sugar that's made in a sugar cane plant. It's renewable. It comes from photosynthesis, so you can just grow more sugar cane plants to get more. There's heaps of it. It's extremely cheap compared to other carbon sources that you could use for this process, and it's also environmentally friendly, much more environmentally friendly than other carbon sources that you can use for this process. And of course, in Australia, particularly in Queensland and New South Wales, it's a very important agricultural industry. So this is how we do it, very simply. This is a very much simpler um, metabolic network compared to the one that I showed you earlier. 
So we feed the cells the sucrose, that's the carbon and energy source, and it flows through, this is called central carbon metabolism, and it's basically how the sugar gets through the cell and towards the pathway that we want to then engineer to make these guys down here, which are 10 carbon and 15 carbon molecules, which you can turn into jet fuel. Now, this bit here is the bit that we need to engineer. So we have to introduce this pathway, and then we have to get as much carbon as possible from this guy down through this pathway and in here. And we use tools of synthetic biology to try and increase that flux of carbon into, those guy, into these compounds down here. So we're basically trying to convince the cell to do something that it wouldn't otherwise do in order to produce an industrial chemical that we would like it to use. So in Australia, since there's not very much going on in synthetic biology. In the past, we've had a number of different revolutions that everybody will recognise. So there was the Industrial Revolution when we made machines that could do work for us, and that was great, washing machines, vacuum cleaners later on. Um, there was a green revolution, otherwise known as the agricultural revolution, when we managed to produce enough food to feed the growing population. And in the last decade or two, there's been the IT revolution, and, and we're all sort of very cognizant of the effects of that IT revolution. So I wish that we'd hurry up and get more iPads in so I can get one. At the moment, we've got the biological revolution. So here we are in the middle of the beginning of the biological revolution, and synthetic biology is really at the, the cutting edge of this revolution. There's a huge amount going on in um, the USA and Europe, so you can see from all these little green dots all the different places that are doing synthetic biology, not so much in Australia. So we're really just getting started, and there are very few labs in Australia that are really truly doing uh, synthetic biology. I'd just like to end by giving you a bit of a picture of the future of synthetic biology across the world and, and in, in Australia. What we would like to be doing is seeing the cells as sort of like a car chassis. And you can start with a chassis and then bolt on all the little modules that are required for that cell to produce the compound that you actually want it to produce. So it might be something that, for example, in the case of jet fuel, which is very toxic, it might be something that decreases the toxicity of that product. Or it might be a pathway to, that makes the precursors for that particular product, etc. And then you just kind of add all these guys in at the DNA level, and DNA encodes the proteins that you actually want to, to work with, and then you have your superbug, if you like, or your, your industrial um, highly engineered organism that makes the product that you're interested in. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank RIOLS for having me here and, and also the support from DISA and the other um, companies and government organisations that support our research without which we couldn't be doing this. Thank you.